Good morning. Good morning. Again, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. If you notice real close, I might have one eye halfway shut. It was a long 10 days. It was a long trip coming home, and I'm still tired, but we're going to get through this. I'm only one of nine is just as tired as I am. If Matt doesn't go to sleep back there, we might get through this together here today. <clears throat> I've entitled my message this morning, Go. Now that might seem fairly obvious of what the message is going to be about. But as I so told Shelby when she came in this morning, this was without a doubt the best trip we've ever had to Guatemala. And I've said that now for 18 years. But it is about the best trip we've ever had. We had a wonderful team to go with us. We did a lot of, I think, good. We did a lot of work. Uh, the other eight took care of me pretty much and didn't work me too hard. Uh, so it, it was just a wonderful, wonderful, blessed trip. For the scripture this morning, I'd like to read from Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 19 and 20. And I'm sure you all know this scripture very well. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And over in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 48, it says this. For unto, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of them they will ask the more. And then again, back in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 40, it says this, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come before you at the throne of grace, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be here and to speak on your behalf. And I pray, Lord, that everything I say will be in accordance to your word. I pray, Lord, that they will be your words and not mine. Father, you've blessed me undeservingly and you've blessed me through the people of this congregation as well as many other congregations and it seems like I get all of the reward for all that they do I get the reward for the goodness that you put on my heart that I couldn't do with the help without the help of many, many, many others. Thank you, Lord, for that. And thank for you, Lord, for the opportunities that you've given. And I pray today that the words I am allowed to speak will be a blessing to everyone that hears. Because, Lord, they truly are part of everything that took place for the last 10 days. 
Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> I've told you before when I usually when I speak I get up about five in the morning to go over a message that I've tried to prepare and tweak it. Well I'm not gonna tell you that today. I got up at four o'clock this morning and put a message together because in Guatemala I had planned on preparing this message that didn't happen. I thought, well, I'll work a little bit on the plane trip home. That didn't happen. When I walked in the house yesterday morning at 20 to 6, I had just enough time to bring my baggage inside the front door, sit it down, and I was asleep at 10 minutes until 6. Yesterday was my wife's birthday. We chatted a little bit, talked about the things that took place in Guatemala after I got up, after 12 o'clock. And we went out to dinner and just had some good visiting time with people. And I went to bed last night about 9 o'clock again. So what you are getting is hot off of the press. <laughs> now it's not anything new and it's not anything unique because I truly believe God has given me what to speak on today. Some of you have heard some of this before from the mission trips in the past. But I don't care what happened last year or the year before that, everything that happened this year was unique. It may have been of the same nature, but it was truly unique. It was truly inspiring, and it was truly a blessing, I believe, to everyone that went with us. I being the old man of the group, claimed the biggest blessings. The other eight wouldn't be part of it. We had a young 18-year-old girl with us for the very first time that, of course, just like when Shelby went, we all worried, how is this going to be? How will she fit in? Will she be a blessing or will she tear down what we've done? And just like when Shelby went, this young lady was a blessing to our group. She was amazed, she was blessed, she was part of the group, and last night or this, yesterday morning when we dropped her off, she said she would love to go again. So I tell you again, it was a wonderful, blessed, glory-filled trip that we had that we call missions. Nineteen years ago, a mission trip to a foreign country was the farthest thing from my mind. I didn't want to be a missionary at all. Now I will say that I admired those that was willing to go on mission trips to do the preaching and the teaching. And I was willing to help. I'd put a few dollars in the plate when it was passed to fund the mission trips. But that's all I wanted to do when it come to missionary work. That was 19 years ago. 18 years ago, I went on my first missions trip. Not because I wanted to, it be said that I was a missionary, not because I wanted it to be said that I was doing God's work, and not because I had missionary work on my heart. I went to shut up my best friend, which happens now to be my pastor. But I went so he would shut up and leave me alone and get off my back and quit pestering me to go on the mission field with him. I had no desire 
to go to a country that I didn't even really know the exact place it was. I knew nothing about their people and I couldn't speak Spanish. Why would I want to go into a place like that? I just told you, just to shut up my pastor. And that was 18 years ago. And that was 23 mission trips under my belt that went a few times, twice a year. What made this trip so special? Maybe the people that went with us. And all of them by one, but one had been there more than once. As I said, we had a young lady go with us for the very first time. We were able to take down with your help and many others, we were able to take down almost $20,000 to help people in Guatemala to fund projects. And I know I've said this when we raise funds, I've said this many times in many churches and to many people. And please forgive me re for referring to this as my mission trip. But anyone that goes can say it's my mission trip. So I'm going to tell you on my mission trip when someone goes with me, they buy their own plane ticket. They buy their own food. They pay all of their own expenses. And we still had almost $20,000 to take down to try to be a blessing to the people in Guatemala, to the orphanages, to the feeding centers, and to people we had never met before to do a lot of projects. When we left here, we left on an empty road going to Dallas Airport. And that was great. We didn't have much traffic. The weather was pretty good. And which was a rarity from it had been in the past. We got to the airport and we zipped, nine of us, well six of us on the first leg, zipped through the ticket counter in just about 15 minutes. And that's that's allow an extra time. That's unheard of at Dallas Airport. We got down to customs, which is always hectic and a drag. We went through customs in about 10 minutes. So that meant instead of having an hour or just a little more to wait in our gate where we were to board, we had just about two and a half hours to sit there and wait which again was good. We could talk, we could reminisce, we could plan. We could even snooze just a little bit. Our plane wasn't full, so we had plenty of room to stretch out going to El Salvador. And when we got to El Salvador, boarded the next plane to Guatemala, which takes about 18 minutes from the time you hit the air to the time you hit the tarmac in Guatemala. The plane was less than half full. So there was no trouble of being crowded. We got to Guatemala again, which is usually terrible when you have to go through customs, you have to get your bags. And there was another, another plane that had come in someplace, so there was a lot of people. At customs, we got picked up a porter, which is the easy way to do. They got our bags on one big cart. And you figure six of us going, taking two bags a piece, plus carry-ons, plus the extra bag that everybody carries, usually a backpack. It was full. It was higher than my head. And that poor little fella done all he could to tug it. As we went through the customs checkpoint, they were taking everybody through the scanners to open the bags and check and see what they had. When we walked up, we gave them our immigration slips and they put us the other way right straight out the door it was a blessing that first day we were tired i think we had to wait usually sometimes we got to wait a half an hour or more on our ride i think we had to wait five minutes 
until Adam got there and to pick us up. And we had a wonderful time going up to his place on the top of the mountain, which was not foggy for the first time in a few years that we got there. It was crystal clear, we could see everything. So I thought, wow, this is really starting out to be a wonderful trip. Now when's it gonna go bad? Well, it didn't. It really didn't. We got a good night's sleep that night. We did our own cooking. Now, that was the bad part. Grover is not the cook that he thinks he is. Don't tell him I said that. We didn't starve. We didn't go away hungry. We just enjoyed it. We got a good night's sleep and started out again on the run. There was so much to do and such little time to do it in. We had taken some supplies down. One thing was five ceiling fans that we took down. We put one in each bag, had to unbox them and put them in in parts in our bags because the boxes just take up too much room. So now you've got to put them back together when you get down there. When we left, all five were up. All electrical work that we could possibly do was done. All switches were in. Everything was working. So that was another blessing. And we had people going in every direction, doing all kinds of work. No arguments. No confusion. Just work and smile. Having a good time with everybody. One thing that's always a big part of our trips down there is we like to have devotions every day. The earlier trips we took, we had them in the morning before everybody got started. The last six or eight, nine years, we've had them of an evening when everybody's tired and everybody wants to go to bed. And in the past, we've missed some because they just couldn't stay awake long enough. This year, I think everyone was at every devotion we had every evening. And it's, this was special because I thought every devotion we had of an evening fit perfectly with the day that we had just went through. Someone different did it each evening. And it was so uplifting. And Shelby's been there, she knows. Most people don't participate. We always have someone doing it, and there's always a few, a handful, that will ask questions and make comments. I think this year, everybody participated just about every night because they felt it. What we were doing wasn't just work. It was something that somebody enjoyed, something that everyone knew that needed done. And every night, something was special was shared with the group that took part that day. And you know, all that being said, that was just the beginning of our trip. That was just the very beginning. We started out on Saturday when the rest of the group got there. Well, uh, they got there Saturday night. A highlight for me was Eddie which has been up here, I've sponsored him for a while, and he's been to my home twice. He got married on Saturday. And he had asked me before we left if I could come, and I said yes, and we got there. I asked him if we could bring the rest of our team, which was six more, and he was thrilled that they came. He was in a little room, about as big as this stage is wide, wall to wall, that's in his mom's living room, dining room, kitchen, everything combined. And there was about 60 people crammed in this room. The wedding was beautiful. His wife, his beautiful, was scared to death. As a, a groom, Eddie was scared to death also. But it all took place. We were blessed to be part of it. 
We couldn't stay for the reception because uh, I had the privilege of preaching that night about 15 or 20 miles away. If you remember last year, we talked about the volcano that had come down and wiped out a whole village. And a pastor uh, had watched so many of his family perish with the lava and the hot smoke and so forth. We helped him to buy a piece of land and to build a church. Well, he had it. And this year he asked us to come out and speak and I had the privilege of speaking. Yeah, that's, I'm not making light of it, that's something uh, so so, but we speak every year, more than one of us speak, sometimes two or three times a night we'll have church services. But this is the only one we had there and we got, and the church was literally packed. It was literally, this is people that had lost everything, not only possessions but family members. And they were there smiling and praising God. And the church was packed. They had saved from their old church one loudspeaker. Now as Shelby can tell you, when you go in as a visiting missionary, and especially if you're gringos, you get the coveted seat in a church. Now, they have big speakers, they like lots of noise. They make a lot of with their band or their piano, their drums, whatever. It's loud, and they set you right in front of them, up front. You're, that's the coveted seat. Well, it was no different this year. That's where we got. They set my hearing aids crazy. Even when I had them out, they were still buzzing. But they had one speaker left, and we were blessed, not as a group, not with the funds we took down, but individuals in our group blessed them with the monetary means to buy new speakers. They had the microphone that when they held it, it had the wire and they had to keep jiggling the wire so it didn't cut out. It was, it was like they were you and them, maybe. That's what we heard a lot because it cut out. And when it, there was sound, a lot of it was static. So we helped them with that too. They fed us, I have no idea what it was. I couldn't pronounce it anyway. And then they brought us a hot, I found out later it's called a banana atoll. And I looked up this morning about six o'clock what was in it and it's a banana and milk and vanilla and cinnamon and it's hot and oh is it good. Oh, is it good. So they blessed us. Now they have nothing, but they blessed each of us with food and with a hot banana atoll. It was 10.30 before we got home. But we thoroughly enjoyed it. We yacked and talked all the way. For the last three years when I go down, rather than hire a driver, it saves us money so we can use the money we would pay for a driver we can use that on another project that's needed so i have helped adam by driving his one of his vehicles and you you can't imagine what the traffic is like in guatemala even at 10 at night you can't imagine the lack of road courtesy the lack of laws the narrow streets but I've been blessed for three years to drive down in Guatemala and none of my people have had a heart attack that ride with me. But it, it was wonderful anyway. We got back home and the other three of our group had arrived and they had a, the same kind of experience at the airport with tickets and everything as we did. No hitches, everybody got there, everybody was tired and everybody went to bed early. We got up the next morning and went to church down at Casa. Wonderful message. We got to hug on the kids for the first time since we'd been there. And they just sort of swarmed around us like they, they do. Maybe for an hour and a half after church we were there and then we had to leave. 
we had to start going, doing work. Adam had went and bought the food that we were going to feed the families with in the churches. He had done that uh, on Saturday morning before we went uh, to the wedding. They'd also went that morning to the orphanage, I believe. It's a handicapped orphanage. And if you haven't heard it before, this is the orphanage where they only take kids that are terminally ill, that don't have long to live, because no one else in no other orphanage in Guatemala wants to take on terminally ill kids. They say it's a waste of money and time tending for those because they're going to die anyway. But we were able to bless them. We had a lot of thousand dollars when we left here for that orphanage. And we took part of that in food and part of that in cash to bless them with. I did not get to go with it because my leg and my back were giving me so much trouble I would have been just a fifth wheel when it come to loading and unloading the supplies. But the stories I heard when I come back was just astounding how they had appreciated everything that we had done for them. This is not in any order that we did things, but so much was done. We went to the a big church and fed, handed out over two, about 250 bags of food to the needy. Now Matt and Grover and them have put together or are putting together a slide presentation that you'll see later of what goes in those bags and it's like five pounds of beans and rice. There's uh, salt and sugar and oil and oatmeal and mush. This year we put in picama sauce which is green and it's hot and it's a very favorite of theirs down there. There was so much food in the bag, they were actually heavy. And uh, we've always put it in plastic bags until last year, I think we started taking bags from here. Sheets had donated a bunch of bags and they were about that wide and about that high with handles. And you couldn't completely shut them, they were so full of food. These were distributed to about 250 families at the church, and each family also got a Bible that we were able to purchase for everyone that we handed out food to. While we were doing the food, Tim and Judy, the dentist and his assistant, and the two girls, Wendy and Alyssa, were doing dental work. Tim worked, and I'm thinking about six and a half or seven hours at that church and did 119 procedures. There was very few cleanings. There was a lot of extractions and fillings and wisdom teeth. He even reconstructed one girl's mouth. It, she, it looked like a pitchfork with her teeth the way they were. And he filled and realigned. and. and she had a beautiful smile after about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. He's got pictures, I'm sure you will see. And that was only one of 119 procedures he did. When he got back to the house, he was a walking zombie. He was tired. Judy was whipped one day. I think he said, that over the six days that he worked there, he did over 250 procedures. 20 here, 40 there, 18. And this is besides all the other things that he did. One of the most memorable, I was talking with Matt this morning when we come in, one of the most memorable, one de-definite, most blessed time I've ever been a part of in handing out food to the needy, and Bibles to the, each one that we give to, is the last night we was there we had saved food to feed the people around Adam's place. They watch, when he's in the States now, they watch his place. 
and they really like him. He talks to them, he helps them, he, he shares with them all the time. So they make sure as much as they can that nothing happens to his property while he's not there. Last year we fed him. This year he said, I want a bag for every family. So we had 40 bags of food fixed up. Well, we can hand out 40 bags of food in less than a half an hour. But we didn't do that. When we left the compound to go just 250 yards away from his and start feeding these 40 families, we decided beforehand we had many, many hot dogs left over from the hot dog roast we did at Casa because they only had 272 people, I think, at Casa, orphans, this year. It goes up and down all the time. So we had a lot of hot dogs left over. We decided to fix a lot of hot dogs, put them in the buns, put them in great big dish pans. And as we handed out food and Bibles, we also give everyone there, from the youngest to the oldest, a hot dog. You'd have thought it was Christmas. They literally enjoyed it. They sit around, they talk. What should have been a half an hour feeding program lasted more than an hour. I didn't have to stand that long. They let me drive the truck an inch up to each house as the rest of them handed the stuff out of the back of the truck. And I had to go slowly through the people because they knew it was coming. They were anticipating it was coming and they were just standing everywhere. As I'd go through, they'd be brushing the side of the truck. When we got to the last one, we had so much food left over. Two women come up and told Adam, there's a village way over there on the other side of the mountain. And when they say way over there, they mean way over there. Adam said, we'll go over there and feed them. They're, they're actually praying for food over there. So we decided to go that way. I had two people and three people in the car with me. The rest of ours, the six of ours, Adam and the two women that told Adam they needed food over there, all rode in and on the back of his pickup. Before we decided to get all the way over there, there was a, a young lady on top of the mountain. And they say the road's steep. We got there, we probably drove a mile on very, very steep road. And when we got to the steepest part, he didn't think that his Tahoe would go up over there without burning out the clutch. So everybody got out of mine, all supplies were put on the pickup and everybody rode on the back of the pickup because it's four wheel drive. And I sat at the foot of the hill while they literally climbed. I couldn't have walked it so steep. And they went up and blessed a family, and I am not sure what's wrong with the young girl, but she has major problems and needs major work. We were able to bless that family with food and with a $500 monetary assistance to help in the medical needs that they have. Now, if you've ever been in a strange place in the woods and there's absolutely no lights, you hear all kinds of sounds if you're in a vehicle and no motors running. I'm sitting waited, waiting at the bottom of, this, bottom of this hill while they're coming. Should have taken 20 minutes. I think it was 40 minutes that they were up there. I waited. I heard every sound that you can imagine while I was sitting there in almost pitch black. Now, I'm not a skittish person. I'm not a afraid, but when you're in Guatemala and you hear the stories of the gangs and all the trouble that takes place, and everyone you see walking in the daytime, most men and some women carry a machete, a machete with them. Now that's used in their work, but it's also used as protection. So I am imagining behind every shadow and tree, here's coming a machete through the car window, and they finally come back. Then we went on the other side of the mountain to hand out, I don't know, 20, 20 bags of food. I'm not sure what it was. I don't know if we actually made it to the village that we was going to because every time we got someplace and saw someone, we stopped and give them a bag of food. 
two kids that had been raised in orphanages, uh, Aura and her brother Edwin, came to help us pass out this food. Aura is a beautiful, beautiful inside and out young lady studying to be an architect, putting herself through school by teaching Guatemalans English. And she talked her brother into coming to help and they were such a blessing. He is a Christian, but he was not an active working, outgoing Christian because he works for a company. His time is spent working and sleeping. But he came and it was blessing just to watch him minister and hand out Bibles, run ahead of the truck with food to give somebody. We stopped on another hill that was so steep. I had to sit in the Tahoe and hold the brake the whole time that the man, Grover, limped up and almost fell down the mountain. The trail was so steep. Those people run up and down. Our people really had a hard time. And I think Grover said about 200, 250 yards up over that hill. Dust just about this deep on that trail. And they carried food up to this family. They had two kids in casts, one from the waist down, I'm not sure what the other one was. This, the two of the kids in this family, we helped bless them with $500 of project money for the medical needs that they had, which were great. The food would meant more to them than anything else. We had to go down about a half a mile on down the mountain so we could turn around. That would have been great. That would have taken a few minutes. Probably took us 40 minutes to do that. Because after we turned around, coming back up, we saw so many people, and we would stop and hand out food and a Bible and a word of encouragement. There was one church that had a few people in. We took a bag of food and a Bible into each one. So finally, we made it back up the hill. Now you're thinking we're running out of food now and I'm in the Tahoe behind the pickup and I thought where are they getting all of this? Oh I can tell you it was the loaves and the fishes because we never run out. There was food, there was bags of food and there was Bibles and there was the beloved fireballs that we handed out. Finally we get to get almost to the top of the hill out on the road going to that village that was praying for food. We passed a man walking, stopped, hollered, he come back, we give him a bag of food and a Bible, and he talked to Edwin, which didn't want to go with his sister to help us give out food. And he stood there and ministered to him three, four, five minutes. Adam pulled out, Edwin had to run to catch the truck. We come along and there's two other people standing. We stop and give them food. One of the best parts is we got in this little town, there was a church with two or three little kids outside. We stopped to give them markers and Bibles. Someone made Bible markers, crocheted with a verse on them in Spanish. We put one of them in each Bible. We give the kids candy and a Bible. And they're right in front of this church. Adam and Grover got off and was taking bags of food in. There was just a handful, not very many, but all the people were up front at the altar praying. They didn't even know we was there. Adam and Grover unloaded enough food and Bibles for each one, put it on the floor in the back of the church, and we left. Now, I don't know what they was praying for. None of us do. But can you imagine what they thought when they finished their prayers and got up and saw this food and Bibles in the back of the church? Wow. Maybe they were praying for food. I don't know. And we went a little further and finally we run out of food. But it's also we run out of people. We didn't see anyone else to give food to. Now, I've been in many giveaways when it comes to feeding villages. We've been to three and four villages where the whole village is dirt poor. 
and we've fed 350, 400 people, families before, amounting to probably 1,500 people. But nothing touched me more than that night. And as I was talking to Matt this morning, it affected him the same way. Because we did something that wasn't planned. The people weren't advised ahead of time to be at a certain place to get the food. We just drove along and saw someone and stopped and gave it to them. Because we had it. And I don't know where it all came from. I know what we bought and I know what we packed up. And just like many years in the past, we went to buy this much and through the deals that we got through the the supplier and through Adam's wisdom in knowing what to buy and how to talk. Instead of getting this much, we got this much. And instead of feeding this many people, we fed this many people. And it seemed like we didn't run out until the last one was fed. We even had enough. We went to Hillmeyer's, and you've probably heard us speak about that. We took him a, a great supply of food. We had $1,000 allocated for Hillmar's feeding center. Tim went and done dental work. He just never quit. Everything that he did, everything that we did, it just seemed like we did so much and it wasn't enough. There was always more. But we had to quit sometime. Yes, it was a wonderful trip. It was a great trip. I've been a part of raising, I'm going to say conservative, because at one time we had a bequeath of uh, $40,000 to take to Guatemala. So I've been a part of probably a quarter of a million dollars going to Guatemala over the years. We've taken a lot down. We've done a lot of good, I think, but nothing compared to the last night that we were in Guatemala this year, when without any plan, without any prompting, without any agenda, we got in a vehicle and drove along a road and blessed people that we thought needed help those that we met. And I'm sure the people that were there were put there at that time for a reason. The only thing I can think is God had them there because He wanted them there. Nineteen years ago I had no plans to going to Guatemala. Eighteen years ago I took my first mission trip, and I feel funny being called a missionary. I just like to say I go on a mission trip. But this year, I know where Guatemala is. And this year I can speak, or I can spell Guatemala. I still can't speak the language. None of it. But do you know a hug and a smile is universal? Anywhere and everywhere. And there's many times you come into a situation where you have to give some kind of a response. A smile answers a lot of questions. If people frown, you know you, they're not supposed to smile. Most of the time down there, when someone speaks to me in their language, I do a lot of shoulder scrudging because I have no idea what they're saying. But everyone knows how to interpret a hug and a smile. And they can't speak my language. And I can't speak theirs. But when you hand someone a bag of food and a Bible 
and a handful of fireballs, it speaks volumes that anyone could understand. I get all the rewards for going down there and telling you just a very small part of what we did. I have received the rewards. I've wiped tears off of my shirt. I've shed tears. I've received hugs and handshakes and pats on the back. And every one of them you deserve. Everything that I've ever received from Guatemala, if it had not have been for you and other churches like this one and other people like you, I could never have gotten. So I thank you from the fullness of my heart for allowing me to be your hands and feet and face and smile in Guatemala. I hope you appreciate in some way what you've done. It would be so easy for me to sit back there and listen to someone else tell this story. But I thank God too that 18 years ago Randy Shoemaker bugged me to death, would not get off of my back, so I would go to Guatemala with him. Now I gotta be bold, and I gotta be just a little bit ornery to say I did the same thing to Grover Dooling, and he did to Shelley, and he did to Matt, and we have done to so many other people. And probably many that we pestered went to shut us up. To get off of their back. To leave them alone. But I stand here to tell you now. That it was the best gift I could have ever been given. I thought at the time it was punishment for something that I've done that they just pestered me so much and I had to go to another country. But it was a gift. It was a gift and I truly honestly feel it was from God. I'm no one special. But because of each one that has went down there being no one special we, you, all of us, have been a blessing to God, to those people. And I urge each one of you to read Matthew, where Jesus spoke and said, As you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You didn't help me go down there to help them. You actually followed what Jesus <laughs> commanded. I thank you for that. I'll always thank you for that. For allowing me to go to Guatemala to represent you. And in closing, I would like to say, next year, I hope you will join me. Next year, I hope you will say, I've got to get him to shut up, so I'll go just to get him to shut up. I received a blessing when I walked in here this morning. And it took me by surprise. I opened the door back in the sound room and my buddy Matt back there looked up and the first thing he said is, I'm ready to go back. Are you? 
Wow. Wow. I'm ready to go back. Are you? I'm waiting for the day that each one of you that have went can go again. And those of you that are sitting here that haven't went can go again. Shelby, it's not too far off for you. I know you'll go again. And I urge each and every one of you that have helped us and those that have thought about it, consider not just being an enabler, and I couldn't do it without you, but consider not just being an enabler, consider going. You would love it. And you would come back and be just like Matt and say, I'm ready to go again. Are you? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to your throne again, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. And thank you, Lord, for the people that you have us go and minister to. Us who think we're nobody, us who think we have nothing to give, us who think that we would just be a fifth wheel or a fish out of water. Thank you, Lord, that you send someone in our path to bug us, to pester us, and to get on our back. Encourage us to do what your word says. Not something that's just to make us puff up and feel proud, but doing your work, helping your people, putting a, an arm around those that just want love. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. For this church, Lord, I would pray that you would pour a special blessing on them. Like your word says, that's so big that they don't have room to contain it. That's so abundant that they can do nothing but give it away. Thank you, Lord, for the love, for the outpouring of kindness that your people have showed me that I could transfer to more of your people. God, you're so good. Words don't describe how much you love us, how much you care for us. And they definitely don't describe the opportunities that you put in front of us. God, thank you for Oakdale and these, your people, my friends. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.